This video contains spoilers for D&D Honor Among Thieves, obviously. Dungeon Masters who have seen the new D&D movie probably noticed that not everything that happens on screen lines up with how an actual D&D game would be played, or should be played. And to be honest, I don't think that's strictly a problem. After all, it's not a game, it's a movie inspired by a game. There are certain rules and mechanics that are necessary for the game to function, but aren't necessary to create an enjoyable movie. Plus, let's be honest, most of us don't play by all the rules either. This is a game where even the rule book tells you to break the rules. But despite all that, I actually do think there are a few things in this movie that real-life dungeon masters can learn some pretty important lessons from. Remember after Edgen and Holga break out of prison, when they make the long and arduous trek from that icy wasteland back to Edgen's hometown on foot? Or when they escape Forge's clutches and spend days traveling from city to city collecting their team? Or when they once again mount up to ride for the graveyard where Holga's long dead ancestors are buried? You probably don't remember all that travel, because it was barely on screen, beyond a few wide shots of the party on horseback. When we did see the group on the road, it was only when something narratively impactful happened. Like when, on the way to the graveyard, they stopped by the town where Holga's ex-husband Marleman lived so she could visit him and get some closure. This is something I think all DMs can learn from. Unless something is gonna happen on the journey that will affect the story, just do yourself a favor and skip it. Do the game table equivalent of a montage and just say something like, after three exhausting days on the road, it's midday on the fourth when you finally see the great stone walls of the city rising up before you. Bam. Done. You might be saying, but Ginny, there can be really cool roleplay moments during travel. Characters can get to know each other. And I don't disagree. In fact, we have a nice little character moment in the movie, after Holga reunites with her ex-husband, where Edgen plays a song to lift her spirits and show her that he cares. But the thing is, you don't have to roleplay whole days of travel in order to have moments like that. If you're ever worried that you might be taking away opportunities for your players to make choices, take action, and interact interact with each other or with your world, you always have the option to just ask them. You'll be on the road for about three days. Does anyone have anything they want to do or say during that time? I especially like how this kind of clear communication prompts players to be proactive with their role-playing. Instead of being passive observers, players have a clear opportunity to choose how they would like to interact. And of course, you as the DM can also introduce story-relevant moments into your travel. I'm not by any means saying that travel should never be an active part of gameplay. I'm just saying that if it is an active part of gameplay, it should be probably matter to the story somehow. I have a video all about how to make sure travel in your games doesn't feel like filler, and I will link it in the cards. Next up, the party is deep in the Underdark when they're attacked by a bunch of undead under the Red Wizard's command. Zenk single-handedly wipes out the entire group, but they quickly start to rise back up. The party realizes killing these creatures isn't gonna stop them, it's just gonna slow them down. Then, on top of all this, Thembershot appears. This red dragon may be chonky, but that doesn't mean he's not deadly. It's very clear that this is a battle the party absolutely cannot win. If they stuck around, we would have had a TPK on our hands. Their goal wasn't to defeat a horde of unkillable undead and an ancient red dragon, it was to escape. I think we've all hit that point where attack the monsters until they run out of hit points starts to get a little boring. That's why I think great DMs make sure that not every encounter has the same goal. By giving the characters something different to aim for, they get to exercise different abilities and strengths. In a conventional combat, the goal is mostly to deal the most damage or most effectively control the battlefield. For example, in the climatic tactic final combat, the goal is to kill Sophina. And sure, that includes breaking her concentration, distracting her, and fighting her animated stone dragon. But ultimately, the battle only ends when either Sophina or the party is dead. In contrast, when the party is trying to escape Thembershod and they get trapped in a sealed stone room, Holga hitting something really hard with her axe isn't gonna solve the problem. And killing Thembershod isn't a realistic option. It's Edgen's clever thinking and the creative use of Simon's cantrip that enable them to win that encounter. And escape isn't the only goal DMs can base an encounter around. The party could need to rescue an NPC, obtain an item, turn two enemies against each other, close a portal, interrupt a ritual, or any number of other creative options. If you 
want to learn more about how to stop combat encounters from getting tedious, make sure to check out my Fixing My Boring Combat video, which I will link in the cards. Finally, let's look at who the villain is in this movie. At first, you might think it's Forge. He betrayed the party and stole Edgen's daughter, only to brainwash her into believing that her father abandoned her. But as the movie goes on, you realize that Sophina the Red Wizard is actually the one pulling the strings. In fact, Forge starts to seem pretty harmless next to her. And just in case you thought Sophina was the worst of the worst, you later learn that she's operating under the command of Zas Tam, an ancient and powerful lich. In short, there's always is a bigger bad. I think it's a good idea for dungeon masters to build this kind of tiered villain structure for multiple reasons. First and most obviously, it builds a natural progression into your game. By the time the party defeats one villain, they've learned that there's actually someone higher up the ladder who will need to be defeated as well if they want to accomplish their goals. With each rung on the ladder, the party is more invested and has more at stake. That means you don't have to go from the ground up introducing a whole new villain with a whole new set of reasons to hate them. Obviously, you don't want to do this in an infinite chain, but I think having three or four baddies who are connected to each other in this way can make for a really compelling plot arc. But the second reason I recommend this strategy is as a sort of an insurance policy. Anyone who DMs long enough will eventually have a session where the players surprise you with a wild idea or a lucky move that allows them to take down your villain way earlier than you initially anticipated. Imagine if the party had come up with some clever way to trap or ambush Sofina before for the High Sun games, had landed a few lucky crits, and had somehow defeated her. Does the whole adventure just end right there? In this case, the plan doesn't completely fall apart, it just changes. Zastam is still motivated to take this opportunity to create a new army of undead and rule Neverwinter. Maybe he tries to execute the plan himself, or he lures some new target into being his instrument. I am not at all saying that you can't let players win. In fact, I think having a bigger bad waiting in the wings makes it easier easier to give players those wins when they earn them. It's understandable to kind of panic if you think the whole adventure you've been preparing for is about to collapse, and that can result in DMs artificially forcing their players to stay on the rails they've built. The more you can leave yourself flexibility to allow your world and your characters to adapt to whatever unpredictable stuff your party does, the more agency you can allow them. Now, before anybody in the comments gets it twisted, I do not think this movie should be treated as DM advice. Even though I think there are lessons to learn from the stuff that I just mentioned, there are also plenty of things that happen in this movie that would be absolutely terrible in a real game. Like bringing in an overpowered NPC paladin to one-shot an entire encounter while the party watches. Or creating an overly complicated puzzle with a half page of completely arbitrary rules in order to cross a single bridge. For those things, there are better sources of guidance. Like this video about how to incorporate puzzles into your games in ways that challenge and entertain your players. Make sure to check that one out next.